Tonight, we start what I think of as the heart of the academic program, and that's the critical studies program, as you know. One of the points of this program is your involvement beyond your attendance at, at lectures. So every year, we choose people to come in as our fellows based in part on their proposal and the experiences and the points of view that they'll bring to campus, but also based on the openness of their ideas and the way that their ideas will be receptive to this community and work with students at the academy to really keep those ideas forming. So we often look for things that are not static and fixed, but things that have possibilities once they come here. Because proposals, as you know, are just, are just that. They're prospects of things that may still come. We know that thinking and writing and making all really takes concrete form once it becomes part of a community and it has collaborators and thinkers. And so we think of this program that way. Uh, it's very clear already that we found an excellent person um, to come help us with that this semester in Anthony Burt. Anthony arrived, like many of you, only a few weeks ago. So he, too, is new to the academy. He comes to us from Auckland, New Zealand. And yet it already feels like he's a longtime member of a community. And that's really in no small part to his efforts to reach out and be curious and inquisitive about what we're doing. So thank you, Anthony, for diving right in in three short weeks. Since many of you have already met Anthony and you heard me introduce him at Academy Day, I'll ask you just to bear with me a little bit as I tell you some things that um, some of you may already know. But we've got some new folks in the audience tonight, too. By now and by his voice, you know that Anthony comes from the other side of the world, where he is an art writer whose work has appeared in magazines such as Art Forum, International, and Freeze. He's also a contributor to the New Zealand current affairs magazine, The Listener. And in addition to this, Anthony serves as the director of research in Auckland at the White Cliff College of Art and Design, where he oversees their critical studies offerings and also supports the faculty in the development of their own research. At White Cliff, Anthony helps to build the school's international reputation and relationships, drawing on his time living both in Berlin and in London, and getting to develop relationships in faraway places like Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, <laughs> and Detroit. While he's here, Anthony will be working on a collection of his own essays, building from the ideas that are presented in his talks, but also in the ways that they are worked out. Those ideas are worked out with you in the discussion sections. This new collection of essays will follow on other writing that Anthony has done, essays on artists and exhibitions, ideas coming from all over the world, Germany, Denmark, Australia, among others. And I think we'll start to hear some of those ideas tonight and then watch as they form throughout the semester. So tonight is the first of two lectures, as you know, um, and there'll be many other opportunities during the course of this uh, first semester to talk with Anthony. Consider this, I think, in some ways, the first chapter of Ideas in Progress, and then please do find ways to join in so you can see them evolve as it goes on. It's been such a great pleasure to have you here already, really, for, as I said, for him to come with curiosity and interest and become just a fully engaged member so quickly. So welcome to Anthony, and thanks for being here. Thanks for coming out tonight. It seems like a great turnout. So um, I think the finale of Breaking Bad was a couple of nights ago, wasn't it? So you've got nothing on TV to miss. So it's good news. Um, let me just get this set up for you, and then we can get started. OK, cool. Um, so just before I get started with the actual lecture, I just wanted to extend my thanks again to Cranbrook. Uh, for inviting me to be here. Um, obviously, I've traveled quite a long way um, to kind of join you for the semester, but I'm delighted that um, we found the way to, to make that happen. And in particular, I really want to thank Sarah again for all her hard work to get me here. Um, I checked back over my emails this morning, and I realized that it was actually almost a year ago that you guys sent out the call for applications. So um, it's been a pretty long process, and so it's great to kind of finally get the chance to get the show on the road tonight. Um, I also wanted to thank the artists in residence and also Trisha Holt for the warm welcome you've extended to me um, since I've arrived. So I'm already, as, as um, Sarah kind of indicated, they're starting to feel right at home. Um, and especially now that my wife and son have arrived this week as well. So um, it's definitely starting to feel like a good place to be for a few months. Um, and I just wanted to say as well that I'm also already tremendously excited by the city um, about half an hour down the road, which I've admittedly only explored as a bit of a tourist so far. but. Um, it seems a very exciting place and um, 
sort of nothing like the headlines and then everything like the headlines, but um, it also seems like a really great place potentially to be a young artist. Um, and, you know, when I talk to people and they're talking about renting a uh, studio space for kind of a penny a square foot and stuff, I mean, trust me, you ain't going to find that in New York and London and Berlin. So just kind of bear that in mind, I think, but it seems like the seeds of a really exciting scene are already starting to form down there. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to getting to know Detroit a lot better um, during my time. Um, so, let's start with this guy. Um, so Sarah kind of indicated that most of my work is um, as a kind of traditional art writer, I guess. So I review shows, I um, interview artists, I write essays for catalogue and uh, catalogues and so on. Um, but while I might be kind of writing about specific artworks and projects, I find that I'm increasingly thinking about other things um, and that those other things that I'm thinking about are starting to inform my work quite a lot. And what I'm really thinking about mainly is this kind of question of what it means to make art in a highly networked world and the, the kind of space that we live in today. And in particular, I'm really interested in this relationship between the real world and the, what I would call the disruptive imagination, um, which has been for the past century or so kind of the province of artists, you know, starting with the avant-garde and running right the way through. But that seems to be changing quite a lot and changing quite dramatically just in the last few years. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about this. And so tonight's lecture, um, which I've titled Black Hands, Image, Masquerade and Terror in a Post-9-11 World, is really my attempt to kind of start mapping that changing environment um, and offer really what is an initial speculation about what this could mean for artists and the things that we make. Um, but as I say, without further ado, I'm going to discuss um, the large German on screen at the moment. Um, this is Kim.com, for those of you who don't know who he is, um, and if you don't know the story of Kim.com, I'm kind of about to reveal it to you um, for reasons that I hope will become apparent as the, as the lecture proceeds. So on the 20th of January 2012, the New Zealand police, in collaboration with the US Federal Bureau of Investigation, raided the Coatesville mansion of Kim.com. Just so you know, Coatesville is an extraordinarily affluent kind of um, rural area just on the edge of Auckland, which is um, my hometown and also New Zealand's biggest city. Uh, Dot .com, who's a German a citizen with permanent residency in New Zealand, was the founder of Mega Upload, which is an enormous, well, which was an enormous file storage and sharing site, which the US Department of Justice had labeled one of the most egregious sources of copyright infringement on the planet. And this didn't seem an unreasonable proposition on the face of things, given that Mega Upload at one stage accounted for about 1% of all internet traffic, um, which is pretty humongous. And it was at one point the 13th most visited website in the world. So, you know, again, in an age of Amazon and Twitter and Facebook and such like, that's pretty impressive kind of stats. Um, but dot .com was arrested, his assets were seized, and in the following days, the DOJ shut down Mega Upload on the basis that it had, it had allegedly generated more than $175 million in criminal proceeds and caused more than half a billion dollars to, in harm to copyright owners. Um, I found this image, it didn't seem like Kanye was too worried about that, but you never know whether this is an actual endorsement or just yet another piece of piracy. So. Um, but in New Zealand, large-scale police actions involving armed officers tend to be exceptions rather than rules. So had the police simply arrived with a few officers, knocked on .com's door, served him with a warrant and quietly escorted him from his residence, everything may have been different. But instead, they executed an American request with appropriately American enthusiasm. Um, guns, helicopters, the works. So these are some images from Kim.com's own CCTV system, um, which he released after the arrest, because there was some debate about um, what the scale of this operation actually was. And uh, Mr. Dotcom was obviously very keen to let people know quite how extravagant the whole thing had been. So dogs and guns. Big black helicopters arriving on your front lawn, which in New Zealand is a pretty unusual kind of occurrence. Uh, a whole kind of convoy of trucks arriving to um, seize his goods, which included a huge um, kind of custom car collection. So they, so they already knew what the guy had, um, and for reasons that I'll, I'll reveal shortly. So quite why the New Zealand police did this is still a mystery, um, and it is possible that they thought .com was armed, 
and indeed one of the more salacious rumours um, was that he was found in his panic room with a shotgun. Um, and dot com kind of fueled this rumour himself somewhat. Um, yeah, check, check out the licence plate on his bends as well, so he's you know, not showing too much kind of um, remorse here. Um, and there's also been speculation that the police were under the absurd impression that um, dot com had a kind of doomsday switch. So basically a, a kind of big red button that would erase the content of all of Mega Upload's servers in the time between two of the big Germans' heartbeats. Now anybody who knows things about the way these systems work just know that it's all mirrored around the world, so that would have been impossible to, to do. Uh, so whatever the reason for the shock and awe approach, it's unlikely that dot com would have become the public figure he is today without it. And of course there were plenty of other, other factors that made this a huge story. Uh, so there was, a fa there was the fact that it was a raid on New Zealand's most expensive property. Uh, there was also dot-com's own narcissistic desire to play innocent victim and internet freedom fighter. Um, I think you can probably start to get a sense of what a narcissist this guy is from, from this image. Uh, there was also the fact that it happened in the New Zealand Prime Minister's very own electorate, apparently without his knowledge, um, which is a claim that still seems highly improbable. Um, a police action by a foreign police force on on your turf is pretty unlikely to have gone unnoticed. Uh, so basically everything about the story was big. The police tactics, the political stakes, the sums of money involved, the house and the ir ridiculous American cars that were seized from inside it. So there's dot-com's pink Cadillac. Uh, I guess it's a Cadillac. You guys will know better than I do about such things. Uh, there was also the scale of mega upload. And of course, dot-com himself an enormous German with a fake name and a funny voice, who until then almost no one in New Zealand had heard of. Um, but that though was about to change very quickly. So for the Department of Justice, the New Zealand Police and the New Zealand Government, um, arresting .com was like setting off a grenade in a seal sealed room. All of them were horribly injured by it. So by May, the DOJ, who were and still are seeking .com's extradition for trial in the States, were instructed by a New Zealand judge to give .com's legal team access to all of the evidence being used against him. And by June, just, Justice Helen Winkleman ruled that the raid itself had been illegal, um, stating that the warrants had been so general as to be invalid. And so this left the New Zealand police force with significant questions to answer about the authority for and the extent of their response to the DOJ's request. Uh, but most damaging of all, and with far and away the greatest impact on the relationship between the government and the New Zealand public, was the revelation that in the lead up to his arrest, and this will ring plenty of bells with you Americans, uh, dot com had been spied on illegally. Um, and just so you know what you're looking at here, it kind of looks like Lord of the Rings except this, the kind of two humongous golf ball buildings in the foreground. Um, this is the headquarters or the spy headquarters of the Government Communications Security Bureau, or GCSB as it's known in New Zealand. And so the GCSB is New Zealand's most powerful and secretive agency whose, man whose mandate is to intercept foreign communications and gather useful signals and intelligence. Uh, and so it's a crucial part of the Five Eyes Network, which some of you may have heard of, um, alongside similar agencies from the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, and you guessed it, the United States. And so the Five Eyes Network is essentially, as we've started to um, learn, is the global eyes and ears of the NSA, effectively. Um, but what the GCSB can't do under New Zealand legislation is intercept the communications of New Zealanders um, who are classed both as citizens and permanent residents. So it turned out that someone at the GCSB had forgotten to properly check what .com's residency status actually was. Um, so he was and is, for the purposes of this legislation, a New Zealander. So effectively he holds a green card, what we would um, consider a green card, which means that they're not allowed to uh, intercept any of his communications, and it turned out they were doing that for a good couple of years. Uh, this, as many of you will know, one, is one of the slides that um, Edward Snowden released um, from the, the PRISM program. And what I find kind of super interesting about all these slides is how utterly hideous they are. It's like they, you know, they had all this money to kind of spend on spying, but not on PowerPoint design. So, <laughs> so, 
Um, so one of the great champions in this fiasco was John Campbell, who was an affable, highly respected television journalist who used his eponymously named news program uh, to pursue the, the story on national TV. And so his approach was old school Watergate journalism at its best. Night after night, he asked who knew what when and gradually started to unravel a web of connections, political donations and smoke screens uh, and showed that some very powerful people knew a bit more about dot com than they were actually letting on. And so squarest in his sights were two politicians, uh, so New Zealand's Prime Minister John Key, who I mentioned very briefly before, and also the man who was and is propping up John Key's government by giving him the most marginal of majorities in Parliament, the independent MP John Banks. Now Banks in particular was badly injured by the dot-com saga. Uh, before entering National Parliament, he'd been the rather controversial Mayor of Auckland, which is my hometown, um, and he initially denied having much knowledge of dot-com, um, but footage quickly emerged of him partying with the internet mogul. Um, first at a massive public fireworks display that dot-com had paid for, um, as thanks to New Zealand for the granting of his permanent residency, um, which was a million dollar extravaganza that the spy agencies seemed not to have noticed when they were checking his residency status. Um, and later footage of banks emerged giving a speech at dot-com's birthday. Um, <laughs> Banks also claimed that he couldn't recall whether he'd ever been flown to Dotcom's mansion, which is, again, the most expensive property in New Zealand, in a helicopter for a private meeting. And then, as if credulity hadn't been already been stretched beyond its limits, he claimed to have no knowledge of a large donation made by Dotcom to his failed mayoral re-election campaign. And this donation was recorded in Banks' um, books as anonymous. Uh, and under New Zealand law, if you know where it's from, you've got to tell people. So this is where the controversy lies with this one. Uh, and so Dotcom maintains that Banks and his staff directly solicited the donations from him. Okay. So, you know, obviously when I s describe a story like this, it, it starts to sound a little like a kind of missing um, South Pacific series of The Wire or something. You know, it's got, it got all the kind of controversies and political kind of machinations that you would expect from something like that. And I could actually keep going on for hours about the dot-com case, and indeed it's, it's still unfolding as we speak, and it's really having a pretty significant impact on the political landscape of my home country. Um, but for our purposes, there are three things about the case in particular that I really want to focus on for the rest of the talk. So first of all, uh, so it's resonance with global debates about the relationship between copyright, data, and the freedom of information. Uh, the profound shift it illustrates in the way information and images move through our culture. And third and most importantly, and this is where I'm really going to spend a lot of my time, is its unreality. So the semi-fictional nature of this event and others like it. And so this first one I think is really the quickest one that we can kind of deal with and get out of the way. Um, because even if you didn't know the dot-com story before today, you obviously will have heard of Julian Assange, Bradley Manning, Aaron Swartz, and of course most re recently Edward Snowden. So this stuff is all kind of unfolded in, in around about the same kind of time frame. And the case that most closely mirrors dot-coms is Swartz's, um, in that both were pursued by the DOJ for alleged copyright abuses. And both were obsessed with pointing out the inefficacy of um, 20th century notions of intellectual property for a 21st century world. Um, so for those, most of you will know the Aaron Swartz story, a very tragic story. Um, I think he died in 2012. He was being pursued by the DOJ um, for a prosecution after he had downloaded an enormous number of um, academic journal articles, um, which he was trying to make freely available on the internet. Um, and, you know, one thing led to another and, and he's no longer with us, which is, which is a terribly sad thing. Um, but of course, there are, so there are a lot of similarities between Dotcom and Swartz's cases, but there are also huge differences between them as well. And so for one, Swartz's campaign was vehemently against the monetization of knowledge. You know, he believed that this stuff should be totally freely available on the internet, that, um, that people shouldn't be charging for, for academic research. Um, whereas dot-com's relationships with money, information, and the internet are far more ambiguous and probably far less altruistic as well. So, you know, you don't end up living in New Zealand's most expensive residence by accident. 
However, both cases are cornerstones of the international debate about copyright laws and their place in a digital world. And the participation of New Zealand's law enforcement agencies in the dot-com case also highlighted a deeper national problem, the current New Zealand uh, government's fear, ignorance or misinterpretation of dig digital technology's potential. Just a few other examples include the decision not to fund a second high-speed internet cable into the country, which would massively increase speed and capacity, huge negligent data leaks from several government departments, um, absurd announcements about the dangers of 3D printers, <laughs> and the labelling of bloggers and journalists who point out basic government security flaws as hackers. And this is, of course, really consistent with recent events in other Western democracies, and most noticeably here in the United States, where the borderless potentials of the internet pose really significant threats to a unified sense of national self. And so bluntly put, what's emerging is a standoff between a dominant group whose understanding of the world is monolithic, centralised and property-based, and an increasingly agitated minority for whom meaning and therefore coherence is formed out of connectedness. And so that brings us to the second point about the dot-com case, um, which is the power of the network to reshape the way information, images and, uh, um, sorry, information, images and ideas flow through our culture. So as the DOJs quickly learned, um, trying to contain dot-com and his activities is like trying to catch water. Because while it's one thing to take away a man's real-world possessions, his cars, his money, his computers, it's quite another to shut him down online, which is, after all, the place where dot-com is alleged to have um, committed most of his offences, or all of his offences, in fact. So he has, for example, already set up a successor to Mega Upload, despite the fact that he's facing prosecution, um, this time simply called Mega, uh, which already has hundreds of thousands of subscribers around the world. There may even be some subscribers here. Um, and what I found super interesting about the launch of Mega in Auckland was that he um, restaged the raid on his house as a kind of musical comedy to, to kind of present the whole thing. Um, so here we've got his kind of army girls in their short skirts with um, dot com as the centre of attention, as he always is. Um, the armed defender squad kind of keeping an eye on the audience, or I guess you guys would call it a SWAT team. Uh, and he even reenacted the kind of emotional moment when he got um, picked up by the, by the team arresting him. So he also has around 300,000 followers on Twitter, um, which is an important platform for growing his cause, his business, and his ego. And so basically his existence in the culture continues and develops as a result of precisely the same tools he's supposed to have committed his crimes with, which is obviously making a mockery of national jurisdictions at the moment. But I'd go further and say that the reason dot-com is proving so troublesome for the DOJ is because he doesn't actually exist. A dot-com, in a sense, is pure image, a figure that only exists within the network. Now, that's not to say that there isn't a real guy with, I'm sure, real feelings um, who lives in New Zealand with his wife and children. But that guy isn't necessarily the one reshaping the political discourse in my country and seriously annoying the authorities in yours. It's a kind of different dot-com who exists only online. And so in this regard, he seems to me like the perfect manifestation of a shift in our broader culture, which art historian David Joselet so eloquently describes in his short book, After Art. And I think Joselet's book is one of the most significant contributions to early 21st century art history, which is it's basically his attempt to offer a theorized account of the shift from an object-based aesthetics to a network aesthetics. And central to this idea is Joselet's idea of buzz, So Joselet states that it is the status of being everywhere at once rather than belonging to a single place that now produces value for and through images. Instead of a radiating nimbus of authenticity and authority underwritten by site specificity, we have the value of being everywhere at once. In place of aura, there is buzz. Buzz indicates a moment of becoming, a threshold at which coherence emerges. 
So Doc Com, in a sense, is pure buzz, a figure whose coherence and therefore his cultural and political potency only emerges through images and their circulation within the network. So he's literally everywhere at once. Now, Joe's lit, of course, has probably never even given Doc Com a thought. Um, but what his book really seeks to do is navigate a way out of postmodernism, and in doing so, finally put Walter Benjamin to bed. Or probably more accurately, the rather clunky way that Benjamin's highly nuanced ideas were taken up by postmodernist art historians in the 80s, who used his theories to make sense of the relationships between art making and a broader culture of image proliferation and saturation. And Benj Benjamin's key essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, rightly or wrongly became a kind of critical weapon of mass destruction in the 80s and early 90s. A pretty nasty tool to mop up the last guerrilla pockets of modernism. And so many of you in that quote that I provided just before will have noticed Joselet's use of the word aura, um, which is of course inextricably linked with a specific kind of mourning or a sense of loss articulated in Benjamin's essay. Uh, but here's what Joselet has to say about that. So this again is a quote from Joselet's book. As Benjamin was well aware, one of the primary aesthetic and political struggles of modernity has been the dislocation of images from any particular site and their insertion in networks where they're characterized by motion, either potential or actual, and are capable of changing format, of experiencing cascading chains of remediation. Images are no longer and probably can never again be site-specific as Benjamin diagnosed, which means that instead of witnessing history, they constitute its very currency. Um, and he goes on, in another part of the book, he's been talking about the um, restitution debates. So, for instance, the Elgin marbles and the, the desire for them to go back to Greece. Um, so this is why the restitution debates I've discussed um, belong to our historical moment. They represent a fundamentalist effort to restore aura at a juncture when the potential of image circulation and the population explosion of images is irreversible. And so I've highlighted those, those bits in red, which I think are really important. And I kind of find the language of Joselet's book super interesting as well, that he would use terms like fundamentalism and explosion and things like that in our, in our kind of current climate to describe this shift. Um, and this is something that I'll be picking up on again shortly. So essentially in Joselet's formulation, um, Benjamin's vision of the mechanical future has kind of finally and fully realized itself. And so we could then see dot com as both an individual embodiment of that mechanical future and also one of its most crucial facilitators. A man who only exists as image, but who nonetheless has managed to create the world's largest platform for the free circulation of information and ideas. And so in a little under 100 pages, um, Joselet deftly tackles museum architecture, relational aesthetics, repatriation debates, the overheated art market, and post-colonialism. But interestingly, um, he doesn't directly take on trauma. And this seems a pretty major omission, given that the defining images of, of our age are associated with trauma, and that those images have also gained their social and political currency precisely through the kind of circulation that Joselet helps us to understand as buzz. So in the early 90s, the so-called CNN effect um, became one of the dominant theoretical models for understanding the impact of modern media on our understanding of the world. Namely, that through 24-hour news cycles and the relentless repetition of images of suffering, we became desensitized to the things being represented. And so the, the examples that were often cited were the genocide in Bosnia, and of course Rwanda at about the same time, and the horrifying effects of famine in Africa. Um, so these were often cited as, as kind of key examples in this kind of desensitization that we went through. But even the greatest photography essayist of them all, Susan Sontag, um, conceded in a late book that perhaps she and others had been wrong about this. Um, and the defining traumatic events of the 21st century when viewed through Joselet's framework uh, give us every reason to agree with that late revision by Sontag. So I'm just gonna provide a list for you now as well. And you can all read, so I'll let you read this one.
Okay. Um, so there's a reason, obviously, that I've just given you a list rather than going through specific images of these things. And that's because I'm willing to bet that in most cases we imagined the same images or at least images from a similar set um, for each event. So for instance, a plane hitting a tower or possibly a falling man, um, a bearded, bedraggled dictator being hauled out of a hole in the ground, or maybe a statue of him falling to the ground and being whacked with shoes, a young female military officer dragging a detainee around on a dog lead, um, or young men in orange suits blinking in cages under the Caribbean sun. So under Joselet's formulation, the buzz generated by these images has supplanted our need to see them. And in a weird way, their constant reproduction and recirculation makes us more sensitive to their content rather than less. So just look, for instance, at how an entire global political and social discourse has been transformed by the image of a plane hitting a skyscraper. Um, and of course, you might also notice names like Assange, Manning, and Snowden, and the rest of them on that list too. And so here what I'm trying to um, point out is that trauma is not simply about actual violence, um, but rather about radical disruption. So acts, events, and images beyond expectation that alter our understanding and experience of the world. So in that sense, I think you can kind of see those names as, as sort of traumatic figures in a sense. Okay, and there seems in this to be a really big difference between um, these 21st century traumas and those of the 20th, because whereas so much um, trauma photography of the last century was, as Joslet points out, history's witness, so Hiroshima and the Holocaust being the most obvious examples, 21st century image trauma is defined instead by narrative potential. And so the Australian art historian Jill Bennett argues that such images and their impact demand new theoretical models beyond traditional disciplines such as art history. So in her words, an exceptional event by its nature exerts pressure on conventional disciplinary practice. And so she suggests that 9-11 didn't enter art and writing as an historical event, but rather as a um, phenomenological shift. So essentially an event that reorganized our relationship with emotional experience rather than material fact. And so Bennett argues that we must therefore find new ways of dealing with the affective quality of images. In other words, their ability to trigger sensory, physical and, and emotional responses rather than simply demanding formal analysis. And so to do this, she puts forward a model, of, a model called practical aesthetics, which she says investigates the substance of affective association the sensate binding that links ideas to objects and forges social relations. So essentially in this new environment, she's trying to use this um, interdisciplinary approach to privilege uh, emotion and um, sensory experience and the encounter with these images, rather than just simply dealing with what's in them. So it is in Bennett's formulation, the affective nature of 21st century images of trauma which trouble us most. It's their ability to make us anticipate rather than merely observe or read pain. And so what becomes very interesting about the defining images associated with these events is that they aren't images of actual suffering or carnage, but rather images of pure potential that capture a near, fu a near future or a just past. So the most culture-shaping images of the London bombings of 2005, for example, are not of a blown up bus in Tavistock Square or destroyed and bloodied train carriages. Thus, CCTV pictures of four innocuous looking young men of South Asian descent wearing backpacks entering a train station just north of the city. And of course, one of the most potent effects of this was that young South Asian, Central Asian or Middle Eastern men um, wearing backpacks in London suddenly weren't so innocuous anymore. They became symbols of threat um, which is a pretty traumatic psychogeographic shift for one of the most multicultural cities in the world. And here in the US, you recently had your own occurrence of this, as two young guys, again wearing backpacks and caps, um, unleashed hell on the final mile of the Boston Marathon. But once again, the most powerful images from this incident aren't of the horrible injuries that the Zanev brothers caused, but rather the moments before and after. Um, so first there was the crowdsourced um, patchwork of images that identified two young men as the likely perpetrated, perpetrators. And I don't know whether any of you were online at the time, but I was on Twitter and it was this kind of extraordinary um, event where just 
the stuff started flooding in and you know every photo that you could imagine from that scene and gradually of course it came together that they noticed these two guys with the backpacks so this identified the two young men as the likely perpetrators but second and far more powerfully in my view um, is this image captured days later in a suburban backyard it's the radiant outline of Jokard Zainayev's um, prone body, folded, if you look closely and imaginatively, as an artist friend of mine pointed out, um, vaguely in the shape of a handgun. Um, he was also he was badly injured, ble bleeding heavily, and hiding under a boat's protective cover. And so captured from a police helicopter, this, of course, is a thermal image. It's a picture of heat. And it confirmed two indisputable facts. First, that he was there, and second, that he was alive. But what's so remarkable to me, if we think about Bennett's kind of model of an affective bodily relationship with these works, is this relationship here between heat and blood. So Zanev was suffering from severe blood loss when he emerged from the boat. So one can assume then that over time his thermal imprint would have faded eventually to nothing, at which point the helicopter wouldn't have been able to see him at all. And so I think as a kind of example of the kind of narrative potential of an image, this is pretty, pretty potent. And so it was just a month later that two young men hacked a soldier to death on a London street. Um, and this was horrific, obviously, but far more profound from a cultural perspective was the remarkable video footage, which was captured on a passerby's phone of one of the killers, speaking excitedly but rationally in the immediate aftermath about why he'd done it. His arm is visibly soaked in blood, and he's still holding the murder weapon. And so people who've lived in London for any period of time um, know straight away from his accent and his slang that he's a fellow Londoner. From the visual and audio information, we can also make other assumptions that turn out to be true. That he's probably of Nigerian descent, or at the very least, de definitely West African. And that he probably grew up on an estate, uh, the equivalent of your projects, I guess, um, on, the, on the south side of the river. And all of these things turned out to be the case. So he is then a visual and cultural embodiment of the city as much as he is an instigator of a huge and important disruption within that city's cultural fabric. And so that killing, which is the, known as the shorthand of, of Woolwich because of where it happened in London, um, so not long after the Woolwich killings, a friend um, who grew up in London and who still lives there sent me this brief email, which I'll let you read. Now bear in mind, of course, that this is a city that went through a, um, a much more substantial bombing in 2005 in, in terms of the actual scale of a terror attack. But Woolwich seems something different, um, and obviously I've added these italics myself to illustrate that it's primarily the power of the image um, rather than the act that matters here. In a city the size of London, one murder doesn't cause a seismic cultural shift, and yet this one did because of the powerful images attached to it. Not statements of documentary fact, but records of a terrifying just past, and also a representation of a culture facing narrative crisis. And so this in the Boston images um, illustrated something that we first had confirmed on 9-11, that in a post-nuclear world, we've transferred our fears from the prospect of total collective obliteration to the chance of personal injury. Now, this is a shift from a blunt passive fact that we can do nothing about to a situation of chance, ambivalence, and potential. And I think this shift has got a distinctly um, archetypal edge to it too. So put another way, our fear of mad kings bringing about nuclear annihilation has been replaced by a different paranoia about crazed jesters maiming us, unleashing chaos through more modest acts of terror. So we've become petrified of the hidden face that plots against us, laughing. So the most obvious example of them all, um, Bin Laden, but also the Zanayev brothers, um, an anonymous Nigerian boy in London. And just to take the Islamic tinge off this, because I don't want to make this exclusively about that at all, Figures like Anders Breivik and James Holmes. 
And remember also that Holmes specifically took up the figure of the Joker um, when he carried out his acts, which is something that I'll, I'll pick up on later on. Okay. Um, but I do want to step back from all this carnage for a minute so the, the mood in the room doesn't get too heavy. <laughs> um, and reflect on the history of this particular archetype that I'm talking about, the jester. So the jester or the joker is a specific manifestation of the mythological trickster figure, um, which appears in most cultures around the world. And in his brilliant book, Trickster Makes This World, Lewis Hyde shows that the trickster is, above all else, and in every culture in which it appears, a creative force, a force for change. And central to this is the trickster's power to disrupt the status quo, to step beyond the worlds of gods and men, unencumbered or willfully negligent of the rules that dictate behaviour in each. So, for example, trickster might steal fire from the gods, giving man his first and most important technology. Similarly, though, the trickster creates the forces that keep us rooted in our own mortality. Most notably, the trickster is often responsible for our desires, so our need to eat, to drink, to fight, to love, to fuck, and so on. The trickster's mischief, um, therefore, reminds us of the connections between our morality and our bodies. But most importantly, and this is an idea that I really want to hang on to through the rest of the talk, tricksters are crosses of thresholds. They are in many cultures the only figures who can move between the worlds of life and death or between the heavens and the mortal world. And so the court jesters of the Middle Ages and the early Renaissance manifested a similar ambivalence. Anchored in the vulgar, vernacular, folkloric world of common people, they were also integral members of the royal court, often exerting huge political influence over their rulers. They were, in a sense, sanctioned rule, break rule breakers, uh, professional fools who reminded rulers of their weaknesses and brought kings and queens back to earth with a thud. Masquerade thus became both a means of protection, the, the performance of a false identity to preserve the real body lurking behind it, as well as, as a symbolic manifestation of a transgressive status. And such figures also acted as release valves for conservative, otherwise stagnant cultures. And indeed, this is one of the reasons that masquerade plays such a dominant role in carnival, um, which is historically the one time of year that religious communities allow their members to cross, th cross thresholds and let off moral steam. Um, so this is obviously a very kind of traditional um, carnival in the Venetian sense, um, but something a little closer to home. And just for Mark Newport, so. <laughs> um, because who doesn't love the New Orleans Indians? So. Um, but there is one really telling line in Hyde's book, which has resonated me, uh, resonated with me a lot in my research and in writing this lecture, and it's this: If tricksters are around, the gods themselves must suffer uncertainty. And so I want to apply that to our contemporary situation. So we can clearly see how this applies to acts of terror, uh, the primary power of which is not the explicit carnage they cause, but rather the narrative and cultural uncertainty that they create. And this is also where I want to return to where we started. Because while we may not be as concerned anymore about the threshold between this world and the next, or between heaven and earth, our lives are shaped around a technological threshold, the space between the real and the digital. One is a space of nations, gravity, and pragmatics and the other is a space of infinite, diffuse potential. And so it's interesting to me that the language of fear used to describe terrorism is increasingly being used to describe the internet, or perhaps more specifically, the threat posed by those figures who've mastered it. And the fear this technological mastery elicits isn't so much of the digital world per se, but of the glitch. So basically the moment in which the, the digital spills into real space. And so to get back to our man.com, um, he's a perfect example of this. Someone whose online world has a very real ability to pick the pockets of Hollywood studios, music labels, and so on. And .com himself is also a fool in the old-fashioned sense. He's an enormous man with a funny voice and a fake name, living in New Zealand's most expensive house, and making millions off an online service, while he himself has time to become a champion gamer. Uh, so he was, for a time, ranked the world's best player of Modern Warfare 3. 
Um, and in fact, this is just as an aside, this is how he discovered that the um, spy agencies were actually spying on him because he had his own fibre cable running from central Auckland out to his house so that he could always be online playing modern warfare and he noticed that the connection was slowing down. And then when he did a, um, a kind of test on it, he discovered that there were seven or eight exchange points rather than the two that should have been there normally. So the line was being tapped at various points. So. Um, so his gaming actually played quite an important role in the, in the whole thing. Um, but he's also a buffoon with serious political and cultural clout, someone simultaneously disrupting the political discourse of his adopted country while also posing serious questions about global copyright. It's kind of tiny bottles of water you have to bear with you. <laughs> Okay, but perhaps the best example of this online jester spirit is the organization Anonymous, which isn't really an organization at all, but rather a dispersed group of hackers who share a collective identity online. And the symbol of that identity is, I think, one of the most um, potent images of the century so far. It's the Guy Fawkes mask, which they co-opted from the 2005 film V for Vendetta, which I'm sure many of you will have seen. Many of you will also know that was an adaptation of a graphic novel from the 1980s, um, but it, uh, the film took a lot of liberty with the actual um, original, in part to kind of update it to our contemporary situation. So the film is set in a Britain of the, a Britain of the near future, where a biological epidemic causes widespread panic and allows a fascist leader to be elected, who then uses his far-reaching far powers to create a surveillance state. And so V, the film's anti-hero, uh, is a Guy Fawkes-like terrorist come freedom fighter whose mask becomes a symbol both of protection and threat, as well as a cover for the terrible burns that he suffered as a young man. And so Anonymous clearly see themselves as an online articulation of V's vision, an organisation focused on causing chaos and mischief for politicians who are intent on knowing our every move and thought. Um, and indeed, Mr. Snowden's revelations have, have kind of given a lot more credence to that idea. Uh, members of Anonymous uh, have also played essential cyber roles in some of the world's most important recent events. So in particular, the Arab Spring, WikiLeaks, and of course, the Occupy movement, which again uses the mask in a similar sort of way. And just to illustrate how interlinked all of this is, it's worth mentioning that in the days after .com was arrested by the DOJ and um, the DOJ shut down Mega Upload, Anonymous launched a huge denial of service attack on the FBI's website, causing it to crash under the pressure. Um, so for those of you who don't know what a denial of service um, attack is, it's basically carried out by hackers who've established what are called botnets around the world. Um, and so those are essentially armies of drone computers infected with a virus. So the owners of these computers won't even know that they're infected usually. Um, and so what that does is it allows the, the hacker to send out an instruction to all of those computers to simultaneously attempt to load the same website. And of course, if you've got hundreds of thousands of computers doing that at the same moment, the website just cracks under the pressure. Um, and so they did this to the FBI's website. Um, took them a couple of days to get back online. Uh, the most famous one that Anonymous launched was against Visa and MasterCard after they um, stopped taking donations for WikiLeaks. Um, so after Assange was, was kind of on the run. Uh, so they attacked those credit card companies in the same way. Uh, so but despite their hacktivism, as it's increasingly being called, um, contributing to major societal change, the language of fear around Anonymous has closely paralleled the way authorities speak about and define contemporary terrorism. Um, and that, in my view, is partly because they use such similar strategies. So like modern terrorists, they maintain loose anonymous affiliations across global networks, which make them nearly impossible to track or contain. Like terrorists, they use masquerade and anonymity to create political disruption. And like terrorists, their true threat comes from the glitch, the moment where their digital activity spills into real space. So just look, for instance, at the Arab Spring or Occupy. Um, equally, we could see a, su a successful terror attack as a kind of glitch in reverse, because ultimately it's a failure of information. It's a moment in the network where someone slips the surveillance net and unleashes carnage in the real world. 
I think the, the anonymous videos, I mean, a lot of you will have seen these on YouTube, but they, they almost very much use the language that's often been associated with um, what we would more associate with kind of extremist videos or hostage videos, things like that. So, so they're definitely riffing on this stuff. Um, but I want to return briefly to the figure of V, um, because as much as we're scared of the Ha Ming figure, that individual with the capacity to maim rather than simply destroy, we're also scared to look at the harmed figure. And I think there are manifestations of this all over popular culture at the moment. So the most obvious and probably the cheesiest um, is Batman's Joker, um, who in his most recent incarnation was clearly a terroristic figure motivated by disturbed ideology rather than um, the simple greed of his 1960s predecessors. So he's really the archetypally damaged Harlequin figure, varying between absurdist humor and extraordinary acts of violence. Um, but I think there are other more subtle versions of this archetype emerging in, in contemporary culture as well. And one of them is this guy, who many of you will know. So this is obviously Omar Little from The Wire. Um, and most of you will know Omar as a contemporary outlaw in the kind of classic Wild West mode. A gunslinger who runs, who, sorry, who robs drug, drug dealers and causes chaos every time he shows up. But to establish him as an outsider, Omar also carries two marks of difference or harm. Violations of his body that hold an uncomfortable mirror up to those who encounter him. So the first is the unexplained scar that runs across his face. And the second is more subtle and I think utterly brilliant in the context of the series. Omar's gay. And this, in the context of African-American gang culture, is simply too much for the gods of the towers, the Barksdale crew, to cope with. So, for example, Avon and Stringer regularly refer to Omar as that cocksucker, not just as an insult, but as a statement of horrified fact. So Omar's sexual otherness is a classic trait of the trickster. He's also a threshold crosser. So moving between the world of the Barksdale gods and the cops trying to catch those gods out and getting what he needs from both. He's also capable of extraordinary violence, as we see on regular occasions throughout all the series, but also of revealing incredibly eloquent truths. And when it suits him, he's also a liar. Um, so here's a classic sequence from, uh, I think from series one that I want to show you, in which I think all these trickster traits are in play in Omar. So um, Mike, if you could flick things over. Characters of modern TV there, but I think the fact that he schools his guard in classical mythology says everything you need to know about Omar's archetypal heritage and his kind of awareness of it. Uh, there's also the absurd costume, so just look at how he knots the tie before he kind of goes into the courtroom. There's the fact that the slimy lawyer calls him amoral, and indeed amorality is a kind of defining trait of the trickster, as opposed to immoral immorality, and that's an important um, distinction to remember. Um, and there's also the fact that he turns an attempted murder charge into a moment of slapstick comedy, so nobody in the room feels the slightest sympathy for Mike Mike who he shot in the ass. So everything about Omar is disruptive. When Omar's coming, everybody knows something's gonna happen. A related figure is Richard Harrow from Boardwalk Empire. Again, we have a damaged man wearing a half mask to protect others from having to confront the horrors of mechanized war. The split face is also a metaphor for the two sides of his persona. On the one hand, he's quiet, protective, and servile. But on the other, he's a creative force. And so we see his private journals and his drawings throughout the series. But he's also capable of extraordinary violence, as we kind of saw at the end of the, the most recent series. So in the context of their respective shows, Omar and Richard are figures of huge ambivalence who drive their respective plots by creating uncertainty. They're neither good nor bad, but instead occupy the amoral creative space of the trickster. And so Richard Harrow's specific injuries, um, which we see covered up here, are also worth um, considering for a moment. Um, because he received them during World War, Ta World War I, serving um, in Europe during the First World War. And this was the war that changed everything. Our understanding of scale, our understanding of uh, technology's potential, our understanding of our own capacity to bring about our mechanical destruction.
And in his powerful essay, The Storyteller, Walter Benjamin, again, coming back to Benjamin, identified the Great War as the cause of a, of a profound shift in storytelling. And I'll just read you a quote from, from Benjamin's essay. Was it not noticeable at the end of the war that men returned from the battlefield grown silent, not richer but poorer in communicable experience? For never has experience been contradicted more thoroughly than strategic experience by tactical warfare, economic experience, um, Sorry, economic experience by inflation, bodily experience by mechanical warfare, moral experience by those in power. A generation that had gone to school on a horse-drawn streetcar now stood under the open sky in a countryside in which nothing remained unchanged but the clouds, and beneath those clouds, in a, fe in a field of force of destructive torrents and explosions, was the tiny, fragile human body. So what Benjamin highlights here is a profound shift in the interrelationship between our physicality, our imaginations, and technology. A shift that due to the scale of the physical and moral trauma the war caused, killed thousands of years of oral storytelling. So if mechanical reproduction signaled the death of an object's aura, mechanical warfare froze our voices in our throats. Confronted with the realities of our own destructive potential, we found we had nothing more to say. And so World War I itself was in many ways a huge release of energy for a world that had been forced to deal with the greatest explosion of technology mankind had ever seen. An explosion that not only changed people's daily lives, but radically altered society's structures. So between the late 19th, and the early, uh, between the late 19th century and the start of the 20th, a technology called photography reduced the world to chemicals and light, managed to defeat death, and quickly turned into moving pictures that enabled the past to coexist with the present. Clocks were standardized because rail had finally con uh, conquered a continent called America and man could now move faster than natural time. The telegraph, which quickly became the telephone, allowed us to transmit messages along wires, changing communication completely. And even scarier was the invention of radio, which allowed voices to travel vast distances riding unseen waves. The power to generate and harness electricity gave people what seemed like limitless inventive potential and led to an explosion of new cities and industries, of which Detroit is, of course, a classic example. And, of course, just down the road, Mr Ford found a way to take that energy off the tracks and change the way that we move forever. Uh, theoretical physics started to speculate about the realities beyond the limits of the dim dimensions that we could experience or know with our bodies. Um, and I could have given you a really cheesy photo of Einstein here, but I thought, no, this is a perfect opportunity to um, get another famous New Zealander alongside um, Kim.com. So the man in the centre of the picture is Ernest Rutherford, who um, first split the atom. So this is his, his Cambridge um, research crew. And, of course, museums started to gather vast quantities of objects from every corner of the planet, um, something that profoundly changed the way Western artists saw the world. So essentially in the space of 40 to 50 years, we defeated the natural laws of time, space, reality, distance, and energy. And given this technological and informational explosion, and given the thrust of my lecture, we might expect to have seen harlequins and tricksters everywhere during this period, figures who occupied the threshold between the mythic and the modern. And of course we did. America formed its greatest myths around just such figures. The card sharps, sharpshooters, cowboys and confidence tricksters who made the West. Uh, this is the, one of the most well-known of all, Wild Bill Hickok. In Paris in 1905, Harlequin changed the traje trajectory of modern art. Now there are various explanations as to why Picasso started painting Harlequins, but John Richardson in his brilliant biography of the artist provides the most compelling. The influence of the poet Apollinaire According to Richardson, Apollinaire encouraged Picasso to imagine himself in different roles, in particular those that might provide him with an outsider, uh, with an outsider persona. And the one favoured was that of Heliquin, which I think was a, a Belgian legend, um, which was literally a soul escaped from hell. So Picasso not only portrayed Harlequin, but also became him, a disruptive trickster with creative near-magical powers who helped us to see space in a different way. 
And standing on the edge of modernity, uh, Picasso took up this mythic archetype as a way to pr uh, process the changing world around him. It was an identity that stayed with him for the rest of his life. And who can forget the futurists with their absurd manifesto? Or Dada with its even more ridiculous games and performances, both of which were direct responses to the profound changes that technology was making to lived experience. Bolshevik terrorists at the time used remarkably similar tactics to their Islamic descendants today, slipping around unseen to unleash chaos in major European cities, as well as sites directly associated with modernity, like the oil fields of the Caucasus. Where a, where a young revolutionary called Joseph Stalin went after the Rothschilds and other U European and American families who were pulling vast wealth out of the ground. So this is Uncle Joe and he's about 19 years old. Good looking boy as well. And of course in popular culture we saw a surge in silent movies driven above all by slapstick, a form of humour humor that began with court jesters and was followed that by that most moral of theatrical forms, the Commedia dell'arte. And so it maybe seems appropriate that this collision between the mythic and the modern eventually found its traumatic release in World War I via yet another jester, a young man called Gavrilo Princip. Princip was associated with a Bosnian Serb self-determination movement called the Black Hand, a group fiercely opposed to the Habsburg occupation of their homeland. And so after a semi-bungled attempt, uh, Princip took his moment to shoot a prince in a Sarajevo side street, an assassination that had all the bathos of a Charlie Chaplin sketch, but that also opened the gates to the underworld, gates that we've never quite managed to close again. So it seems to me that we're living in a similarly dramatic technological moment. As Joslip makes clear, what matters now is the state of being everywhere at once, suspended permanently in a state of recirculation, repetition, reinvention, and reiteration. Our notion of art is also facing its biggest test since the turn of the 20th century, when Picasso and Braque, the futurists, Duchamp, Malevich, and others upended the relationships between imagined and real space. But our challenge is not to develop visions of newness appropriate to modern society, as was indeed the case in this cradle of modernism that we're meeting in today. Um, our crisis is instead one of competition. Because how can art possibly compete in a world where acts carried out by tricksters wearing masks or lurking in shadows have such disruptive imaginary force? Perhaps then Harlequin's return might give us some tools to find a way through our troubled contemporary space. Perhaps it might also satisfy our contemporary craving for myth, and that in a culture where everything is overexposed and permanently on display, this archetype allows us to embrace shadows again, reconnecting our physicality with our morality as we fumble through the dark. But for an artwork to be profound enough to have an effect within that darkness, the force of an intervention or a disruption, it may have to result from that same energy, the same radicalism, the same potential for intellectual harm even, as an audacious hack at which point we may not recognize it as art at all, but as a glitch, the creative act of an outsider crossing thresholds, capable of imagining violence, but also capable of revealing extraordinary truths. Thank you very much. See if I can get onto my third bottle of water during the questions. <laughs> I'm happy to, yeah. Yeah. And art objects, no matter how often reproduced versus destroyed or grounded, that link is pretty great. What, so how does that play in? Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, if, when you look at Joslet's um, kind of theory in this very important book, um, he doesn't argue against the importance of the object and, it, and its kind of narrative capacities, but he does argue that meaning um, 
is primarily resides now in the network in the in the way that that object gains its currency as it passes through a network so um essentially the the problem then becomes not so much the acts of violence and that's not so much what i'm kind of interested in i'm interested in the images that result from those because the images that we create as artists end up entering the very same network that those things are circulating in so my interest is kind of in the in the kind of parity between those things you know is it a is it a competitive moment do we need to find something else um to kind of articulate it so i think objects can cool, can still convey stories and can deal with themes of violence or or metaphor or whatever but what i'm really interested in is this connection between um image and disruption and the fact that historically you know that was really the space of the avant-garde was to kind of create new ways of seeing space and and for a, for us to kind of think those things through and that seems to have been taken up by the kind of so-called real but these kind of semi-fictional things that get get served up by it um does that answer your question in any way i'm not sure it's kind of kind of <laughs> sort of we've got discussion groups to unravel that one so yeah yeah, yeah. i know you said this from the beginning but how so amazed by all these things can i be that you got what you're saying okay <laughs> Um, ads and subscriptions. So, so the page, it's it's can a. You not anything like I think my understanding of it is that you needed to be a subscriber to Mega Upload to be able to then source the stuff that was held on those servers. So that was essentially where he was generating the the cash from. Uh, no, he was the kind of original programmer, and then a team of them kind of became involved. He has this very interesting checkered history. He'd been kicked out of either Singapore or Hong Kong, I think, um, for kind of insider trading um, before, yeah, <laughs> no surprises. But, um, and so he got into New Zealand on this kind of weird visa situation where only five people in New Zealand have ever got in on this, which was they wanted high net worth people to move to the country. And so you essentially had to have like 10 million bucks and it kind of fast-tracked your, your visa situation. And dot-com got into the country before they realised that he actually had this criminal conviction in Hong Kong um, previously. So he's just been a thorn in their sides all the way through. But yeah, es essentially his wealth or his money is from exactly that, from subscriptions. Um, and so the hundreds of millions that were kind of gathered from that were, were from people signing up. And given that it was, you know, the 13th most visited website on the planet, you can kind of see how that would add up pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I was really interested going back to images. Um, as you described, there's images, there's potential. Yeah. Um, but images are very many future. And I was really, I really feel that, too, because that's like one, almost my initial reaction to the Singapore Olympics happening. Mm. So Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's a really good question, and I think that in my second lecture, um, what I hope to do is kind of focus on. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, um, what I'm really interested in as a strategy for artists around all of this stuff is this idea of threshold crossing, and and the idea that the that the trickster or the jester might provide some some platform for that. And so it's, there's something very unsettling about crossing thresholds. Um, and so I've, I've noticed that artists are kind of dealing with this more and more, or artists that I'm interested in are, anyway. And so there are a couple of artists who I've been dealing with a lot who deal very specifically with um, kind of occult practices or magical practices, things like this. So this idea that there's a slippage or a space between two, two spaces, which is really where I see a lot of these images kind of operating. I, you know, that's why I talk about them being pure potential, because they have a kind of fictional element to them as well. Um, and indeed, that's how the whole kind of political discourse is being um, kind of shaped at the moment, that it's around this idea of ambivalence, you know, that it could happen at any place or, or at any time. Whereas in the kind of nuclear age, we were just afraid that um, somebody was just going to press a big button and it was all going to go boom, you know. So. Um, 
So I think there are artists who are dealing very specifically with this idea of threshold, threshold crossing. Um, so Makala Dwyer is an Australian artist who I've worked with a lot, who I think is doing this really brilliantly. Um, but yeah, so, so that's where I think a space could operate for artists to kind of do something that is discomforting or as, as, um, as affecting in a bodily sense as, as some of these other things are. And that's why the Jill Bennett book that I mentioned is quite important too, um, because it really deals with this idea of affect and kind of sensory experience and particularly emotional experience in relation to artworks. Yeah, does that answer things? Yeah, cool. Sorry, yeah. 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 So there's kind of two things there, right? There's the benevolence on the one hand and the collective thing. As a, can I deal with those two things separately? Is that yeah? <laughs> um, so I'm going to deal with the collectivism thing first um, because I think that we are seeing really, really interesting examples of that in contemporary culture, where masquerade or some sort of performed identity is being taken up by art groups. Um, partly that's been a response to the kind of totally overcooked art market, which still prizes kind of authorship and authority in a, in a particular way. Um, but if you look, for instance, at... Um, so this slide is a work by Claire Fontaine, um, which is one of the reasons I put it up, and Claire Fontaine is an is a artist collective. The Bruce High Quality Foundation in Brooklyn, um, the Rax Media Collective coming out of uh, India. So I'm, I'm super interested in these kind of groups who are kind of strategizing. And in fact, what happens very often with those things is that they don't even look like artworks, the kind of products. So um, the Bruce High Quality Foundation has a foundation where you can kind of go to classes and the Rax Media Collective has made documentaries and various politi political actions and stuff as well. So I think there are some really interesting collectives who are harnessing a particular type of energy to... Um, to somehow bypass the art market or the traditional kind of art, art modes of doing things. Um, on the side of benevolence, I guess the thing I want to kind of draw the distinction around with this kind of trickster treatment is, you know, the trickster as a topic is as big as the moon. And what I'm kind of specifically interested in this talk is, is the specific kind of Harlequin-esque kind of figure, or the Harlequin. And there seems to me a really interesting connection there between technology, violence, and humour which have been, always been kind of um, characteristics of, of those kind of jester figures. So, I mean, the trickster is, because it's neither good nor bad, he, he can operate with huge benevolence. And indeed, you know, the example I gave with um, man getting its first technology that way is a kind of example of that. But because he's an amoral figure, um, and I'm saying he because primarily in the, in the myths it, it is, um, because he's amoral, he can kind of flip and change at will between benevolence and extraordinary violence, you know. Even Omar has his benevolent moments sometimes too. So, yeah. Do you think that all the, I mean, how do you feel about these things about like political ideas that are I mean, for me, I'm, I'm more interested in the energy that's all that's driving all of this stuff. So whether we define it as an artwork or not, there's, I mean, essentially this this kind of talk and this work that I'm doing, I kind of see as an exercise in pattern recognition. You know, hence Omar being here alongside kind of other stuff. So I'm less concerned about how we define it as an artwork or as a as a particular thing, as a as a kind of coming together of a particular energy that seems to be responding to a particular technological moment. And that's why I wanted to make that point really clear about the comparison with the turn of the last century as well. You've got this kind of you know, huge explosion of stuff and for some reason you get this huge explosion of this trickster figure alongside it. And so I'm super interested in how that kind of manifests itself. Yeah. Do we? Okay. Okay. <laughs>